everybody. I am Joe Marcello, joined as always by my partners in comic book crime, Oren Phillips. Hey, everybody. And Mike Farah. Good day. Well, it's that time of week again. It's hump day. But more importantly, let's be honest. Next couple of days are be pretty crucial. Why? Well, it's the holidays. It's Christmas. So what better way to get you through those holidays? Well, then... How about an episode of the Dollar Bin Bandits? And more appropriately, we're bringing you one of our last couple of episodes of our season of Superman. Today, we are proud to bring to you our interview with comic book artist and writer, uh, Jerry Ordway. Uh, he is another one of the, the, the pantheon, for me at least, as it pertains to Superman contributors. Um, you know, he was pretty instrumental in doing work and contributing to John Byrne's Man of Steel series. He also contributed to Panic in the Sky and, of course, Death of Superman. Yeah, also, uh, you know, we love Shazam so much now with the movies and stuff and uh, sort of resurgence, but a lot of that resurgence started with uh, Jerry's work on the character in the 90s and sort of bringing him back into the forefront. Yeah, I think he's a real DC guy through and through and, um, you know, really caught my eye when he was inking um, uh, George Perez on Crisis on Infinite Earths. And, you know, like so many folks we've seen, you know, these artists, particularly inkers, uh, turn into writers. And it was uh, thrilling to see him as part of, uh, again, like Joe mentioned, Panic in the Sky, Death of Superman, being part of this Superman brain trust and determining, you know, where the character was going to go uh, during our formative years in the 90s. Uh, so let's get to it and talk to Jerry Ordway. Sir, thank you so much for joining us. We are, uh, as I said, excited. Um, uh, I, as you can tell, I'm a big DC guy. I'm a Superman guy. So uh, I'm a fan, uh, <laughs> if you haven't figured that out. Um, I'm going to start off uh, the way we start off with everyone. But how did you get into comics? You mean like how did I start reading them or how did I get into drawing well, them? a little bit of both. Um, I kind of discovered them when I was a kid. I, uh, I, I was a, pretty much a Marvel maniac from the time I was 10 years old, I guess. And uh, I just, I, I saw DCs when I was really little, just some comics that had been given to my mom that my brother and I were reading, uh, like old action comics, you know, like the hundred page giants and things. When I was really little, I, I read from a, pretty early age i guess um but then i discovered the marvel superheroes on uh cartoon form on tv on my local uh vh or uhf station <laughs> that was in uh i guess let's say 1966 it was probably the same year as the batman tv show so that kind of i would say that mostly ignited my you know i guess fanaticism for comics um and uh, I started drawing, you know, my own comic stuff around that time. First, you know, I started copying like Marvel and DC. Like I do my own version, like a three page uh, comic of Iron Man or, or uh, the Avengers or something. And, uh, and then I started, I realized that every time I'd show it to somebody, they'd say, did you create this? And I was like, no, I, it's a Marvel comic. And, that somehow felt like it made it, you know, <laughs> illegitimate somehow. So I, I created my own dopey characters and I started drawing my own comics probably around that maybe age 11, 12. Um, and that kind of got me through, you know, just uh, I guess wanting to do it on my own and, and uh, all the while reading Marvels in that period from like the mid about 1967 until uh, I got into comics in 1980. <clears throat> um, I worked in commercial art. I got rejected by DC and Marvel in, um, I think, 1977 on a trip to uh, New York from Wisconsin, where I lived. And then I went back and uh, I got a job in uh, commercial art in Milwaukee and worked at an art studio for a couple of years. And after doing color some coloring books and yeah, you know, activity and games books for Marvel and DC, like licensed, you know, books for Western publishing. I took my samples to uh, the Chicago Comic Con in 1980, where Joe Orlando was looking at uh, 
I guess he was, they were, DC was looking to hire and get new blood. So uh, I waited in a big long line with, uh, we shared the hallway with the Doctor Who uh, costume contest. This was like I said, 1980. So it was all the really heavy, <clears throat> the wool Doctor Who outfits. And it was so smelly and sweaty in that room. It was the middle of the 4th of July weekend. You know, it was the, the Chicago cons weekend. And uh, I was way at the end of this line and started at like 10 in the morning. And then by about, you know, two or three, I started getting closer to where I could actually see there's the room that Joe Orlando's meeting or seeing people at. Finally, uh, inching my way along, I was like one or two people away. Paul Levitz kept coming in and at this point I could see in the office or in the room and Paul would walk in and he'd say, Joe, you know, you're, you've been doing it all day. You gotta take a break, have some, we'll have some food or something. And Joe's like, no, 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 I'll take care of all these kids. So I kept inching up slowly. He took time with everybody. And finally, you know, Paul came back again, trying to, you know, draw him away. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. If I had to wait another day, like I have to go back, like on the Sunday or whatever it was, I just wouldn't have done it because it was, uh, it was just a really horrible, you know, experience of sitting, waiting just to have your work looked at. Um, but then finally I got to see Joe and I had all my coloring book samples and I, was showing him pictures that I did of Batman and pictures of Wonder Woman. And he was totally confused and he was really kind of punchy at the, after the long day <laughs> of looking at samples. He's looking at my Wonder Woman sample. He's like, what's going on? Why doesn't she have stars on her you know, costume? And what are all the stars? And I said, well, it's for an activity for kids. The page was find Wonder Woman stars. They weren't on her costume. They were like in the sky and they were hidden hidden in this picture he was just not getting it and he's like just I was thinking my hopes are being dashed you know he's just gonna tell me to go away and you know do new samples or something anyways he looks at another he goes through it and he's totally confused and again it's a DC licensed project so someone at DC had to have seen it Paul comes back again to drag him away for dinner he said look it's you know now like 4 30 or 5 you know you, you got to eat something oh Jerry Ordway he looks down at the samples. Oh, Jerry Ordway, we've been trying to get a hold of you. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I worked through through an art studio. So I was just, they knew my name, but I, the address, all the contact. I was working at nine to five at the studio. So they, they didn't have contact info specifically or directly for me. So after all that waiting, Paul Levitz was the guy. He had actually approved all the sketches as they went in um, to DC Comics because in, in those days, DC didn't have the big style guide book for their um, licensing, but they used to supply all their vendors with kind of crappy photostats of, of drawings. And the reason I got hired to do these Western um, publishing books was that Western wanted to have their own artists that they could talk to and basically quality control for their point of view. But that meant that they then had to submit whatever pencils and then finish drawings I did to DC for a final approval. So Paul Levitz was Joe Orlando's assistant in the special projects department. Joe didn't obviously approve any of this. Paul knew who I was like right like that. So that was it was just kind of kind of funny after the long wait and the the whole day of smelling uh, the the smell of heat and humanity in that hallway. <laughs> the doctor who. <laughs> Um, I, I, you know, gave him my phone number and uh, I was definitely walking on air for the rest of that convention, you know, telling my friends, hey, DC is going to call me or whatever. And they called me right away. Like the, I think it was, I went back to, was, the con was in Chicago. I drove back to Milwaukee Sunday night. Monday I went to work. And while I was at work, I got a call and it was Paul Levitz calling at my work, which was like really weird, but apparently he called my house and my mom had given the work number. So I felt like I was, you know, cheating on my nine to five job or whatever, but uh, I got a, a, the first job I got was a, uh, I think a six or seven page Carmine Infantino story that I guess was written by uh, Mark DeMattis um, for Mystery in Space, a relaunch of Mystery in Space. And that was, you know, my test of fire or whatever was to ink uh, 
Carmine's pencils, which were very open. There was no black areas in them. They were just line and very design, very designy stuff. Um, and the, you know, the job was we send it to you, take your time, but the faster, the better, you know, I mean, that's implied. So it was like a test. That's what they did with everybody. I think is they, they handed out short assignments and then they would see if you were reliable, if you, you know, turn the work in on time or, right. you know, did it fast enough for a monthly deadline. Um, and I did like a couple of those, I guess, over, that was in, in uh, July, August, September, I did some War of the Time Forgot stories. I did a, I inked Joe Staten, I inked a Dave Cockrum, I, I inked a Trevor Von Eden story for, uh, I think it was another Mystery in Space or something. Um, but just a, like a, you know, an assortment of things. And then in October of that year, I got a call and uh, I think it was Paul again, he called me and he offered me inks on Teen Titans. And I was like, well, I think there's already an inker because the book was already, it just started coming out. And I just thought, well, that's weird. What are, there, are they trying to replace the inker? And I just, I wasn't at a point where I wanted to go freelance. So I just kind of, uh, I said, no, thanks. You know, thanks, but no, thanks. I have a, a good job here and, and I can be happy to do stuff on the side, you know, on weekends. Um, and then I had a little bit of a turnaround at the job where I found out they had hired like somebody above me and it kind of made me feel like, oh, wait, I may not be on a track that I thought I was on. You know, I was, you know, everybody, uh, I think you could get into commercial art to be an illustrator, not necessarily to be a layout guy or a, you know, a, uh, an assistant or a, you know, whatever you want. Everybody wants to do illustration and painting and stuff. So they had just hired a guy to replace the previous illustrator. And that was the top job at the studio. And I knew this guy that they hired was young, you know, relatively young. He was in his uh, late thirties at the time. I was early twenties. So I knew it was gonna be a lot longer of a wait for me to make any kind of move towards illustrator. So I, I seriously started thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't have turned down the Titans. Um, and then I planned a trip in December of, of 1980 um, to see, uh, there, there, the, there was an illustrator's workshop with Bob Peak, uh, Mark English, uh, um, Fuchs, I'm trying to think of the first name, but there was like the four or five uh, illustrators that had the workshop and they would do like a, a weekend seminar. And uh, so I arranged to go to New York City for this uh, with a, a girl that I knew. And um, I figured in the meantime, we'd, I'd take my painting samples up to Marvel. I made an appointment with Archie Goodwin. Um, in the meantime, Len Wein called me and offered me uh, the opportunity to work on All-Star Squadron with Roy Thomas, who was my favorite. I was a huge Avengers fan as a, as a kid, as a teen. And uh, Rich Buckler was gonna be the uh, penciler layout artist. And the timing just worked out. So I, I actually did agree to do that. So by the time I got to New York, I already had, you know, set up my future. I was gonna have to go freelance. I was gonna have to quit my uh, nine to five job and all that. But, uh, but it was, a, I mean, it was all like a, a whirlwind of really in six months time. Uh, and I started freelancing full-time as of, I think, February of uh, 1981. And, uh, never look back. Um, that's a long story. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a fantastic way to, to get your start in, uh, in this world. <laughs> well, and Joe, Joe Orlando was, you know, was somebody that I, I was a fan of and I knew him, you know, through his art. Um, but it was, it was funny, you know, I, he worked up at DC for until he passed away. He was an editor up there and worked on special projects. And he, uh, he and I met several times over the years, you know, before he passed away, we, we saw each other at different things and he never once mentioned, Oh, you're the guy that I gave a break to or anything. I mean, I never got a sense of, you know, he never owned me over it or whatever. Um, I assume he knew me and remembered me, but he never, you know, it was kind of interesting when I think back on it, that we never really had any conversation about, remember that time you almost didn't hire me. <laughs> um, but he was a good guy. He was a good guy. 
I want to talk a little bit about your inking because you think some of the biggest names in comic history, um, you know, Kirby, Ditko, uh, Gil Kane, Kurt Swan. Uh, is there ever an intimidation factor when you receive that art and you know, okay, I have to ink over some of these legends? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think, it, you know, the, the, the biggest one was still getting the Infantino. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like a huge Infantino fan. Like, I, I mean, I was mostly a Marvel guy. So I was familiar mostly with Carmine's Marvel work more than his DC work, really, mm -hmm. because of the 70s stuff that he did when, um, when he uh, was replaced as publisher or editor in chief at DC. Then he, he freelanced at Marvel and did, you know, just a ton of stuff like Star Wars and um, Nova and a bunch of different things. So he was intimidating because I knew the history of, of his work and the fact that he was a big name and a big you know, contributor in comics. And that was my very first job. So I think having survived that, I mean, that kind of has become my, my credo, at least it, it got me through my first bunch of years was if you survive one of these things, the next one's not gonna be as bad, or at least you'll say, hey, I made it through this or I made it through that, you know, to, to get you, through a tough job or through something like that. Um, I didn't get to do Kirby until I knew I had met Kirby and I, I knew him through, uh, you know, seeing him at conventions and sharing a couple of dinners, uh, group dinners. Um, but I, I inked him on the Phantom Force that Image did. And every we all did it for free. Basically, we donated our, um, our talents so that he could get a good image payday for, for that book or for the two issues. Um, so by the time I'd inked them, then it was already 90, I want to say three or something. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'd been in comics long enough that it wasn't totally intimidating, but it was still, when I got the pages, um, I had inked, I think four pages and I want to say four pages in each issue. The first batch, there were two actual Kirby pencil pages and the other ones were done like Keith Giffen had traced off. Uh, pages that had already been inked by um, uh, Michael Thibodeau had been inking Kirby and I guess had some thing that Kirby had been drawing. So they repurposed this, these pencils and, and Keith Giffen brought them back to pencil form so that they could be uh, re-inked by other people. So two of them were Keith Giffen kind of re re you know, recreations and the two that were, were uh, actual Kirby pages were really, they were intimidating because they were just really cool and they were done in the 70s so they were i think they were again cobbled he took stuff that he'd done that didn't get didn't see print and he had done like a a spec comic for uh i think it was supposed to be um a bruce lee comic oh, yeah. that uh they used some pages from that um and that's the one i think the two pages i inked were from you know this bruce lee thing that had been done so they were kind of like prime uh, maybe late seventies Kirby, uh, something like that. Um, but they were really cool. And, and you were inking it, uh, nowadays everybody inks, they print out a blue line. And so the pencils kind of exist somewhere else. Right. Um, but at that point you had the actual pencils. So you ink it and you gotta, you have to wrap your brain around the idea, but if you're inking a Jack Kirby page on the pencils, you ink the whole job. I usually work with a crow quill pen, um, you know, your quill pen on, on the paper, you dip pen. And uh, after you do the line work, you take the eraser and then you erase the pencils. So the concept of erasing Jack Kirby <laughs> like pencils that. is kind of crazy, but that was how everybody did it. You know, I mean, uh, it, it still kind of cracks me up to think about it because when you erase it, you've erased that guy's work. You know, I mean, the, the, the intent is there on the page but his actual pencil work is gone. You know, it's now become your work or your work in realizing what he tried to do. So it's kind of, it's kind of a, like a very weird uh, feeling. And that was almost more disconcerting than just inking the pages was that actually like, wow, Jack actually did this with his 2B pencil, you know, <laughs> taking it all. <laughs> it's, um, it sounds really mean when you put it that way. Like, okay, that, here's yeah, this yeah, guy's yeah. work. You're going to work on it. Then you're just going to erase it. <laughs> And then work all on top of it. Okay. It's, <laughs> it's funny, but that's, that is truly it. And the, the funny thing is of all those guys that I, I, I got to do a Ditko story for uh, 
Batman and the uh, or the Outsiders uh, book that Mike Barr was writing, and it was a backup story with Black Lightning. And DC used to just call me up, and they would say, "Hey, do you you know this might be fun? Do you want to do it?" And it was I think it was an eight page or ten page story. And when I got it, I was expecting the oh, Ditko pencils. And when I got it, it was Ditko layouts. And uh, they explained to me that he intended to ink it himself, but then he got too busy and he couldn't do it. So when he was doing a pencil pencil job, he would put in more shading and things. But when he did a layout job that he would ink after it was lettered, he didn't go to the trouble of putting in line weights or any of that. So it was... Uh, I felt a little disappointed, so I actually had to do more work, I think, to try to keep it looking like Ditko rather than looking like me, you know. Um, but that's always the challenge. As an inker, you don't really, I mean, some stuff you wind up overpowering if you're a finisher, and it depends kind of how tight the pencils are or how loose they are. Uh, but as a just a straight inker, I mean, your, int your intent is to, to put pretty lines on something, not necessarily to redraw it. Um, but most of the jobs that I've done, for the most part, I, I always was credited as finisher and paid a little bit more as finisher so that the pencils could be a little looser. And I always preferred that. So I didn't feel like I was, you know, like uh, overwhelming someone's work, you know, if they really worked hard at trying to, because some people really do engrave the pencils on the paper and, and uh, you know, it becomes a little bit of an issue. When I inked uh, Wayne Boring, uh, I had that problem and it, I did the uh, Secret Origins. I think it was the first issue of Secret Origins in the, uh, in the 80s. And I inked him on a Superman origin. And <clears throat> he had penciled fairly tight. Um, I had no reason to feel like I was gonna have a problem with it. So what I would do back then is I would ink all the line work. And again, I would do the pen work with a crow quill pen because a pen, a crow quill pen holds up pretty well if you have to erase it really hard. Because sometimes pencils can be really engraved in the paper and you have to erase really hard. So a crow quill, then a heavy erasing, and then I'd go in with a brush and I'd heavy up lines and fill in blacks and spot shadows and things. So I would do a bunch of pages that way. So with the Secret Origins, it was a full, I think it was a full issue. So 20 pages or 22 or whatever. I started inking and I would do it in between other work. So, you know, maybe on weekends or something. And I had about six or seven pages inked with pen. And I thought, well, you know, when you get a batch like that, the editor usually wants you to send them in so they can start getting them colored or whatever. So I, I started doing my erasing and I couldn't get the pencil off. And I was erasing and erasing really with a, you know, one of those art gum erasers. I was getting cramps in my arm erasing and I couldn't erase the pencils. And I was eventually what was happening was the, the ink lines I was putting down were actually being erased. Oh, and I was like, Ugh. so I wasted a lot of effort. And I realized that he might have spray fixed his pencils for some reason. So the, the pencils were very hard to erase. So after those first seven pages where I did, I erased as much as I could and then I had to re-ink them, which was no fun because I had to follow my own lines very carefully because the erasing had taken the ink off of it. So after that point, like starting with page eight, I did a heavy erasing of that page before I even touched it with ink to erase it down to a point where the pencils were still visible but not you know, basically it also helped the ink stay on the page, but it was a, that was really a nightmare. And I never, I've never ever encountered any pencils that were done like that. So it made me wonder whether he had, you know, for some reason, maybe, you know, he was trying to protect his work maybe, but somebody should have told me because I would have tried to stay and just exactly follow his lines because it would have, it would have been easier, but, uh, but that was tough. I never, I've never had a job like that. So it had to be something like spray fix. Jeez. Um, Have you made the transition to digital work by any chance? Um, I don't, I do, I can do, like I'll do layouts and I'll print out blue lines to ink. Um, that's about it. I do a lot of digital editing, but I still like working um, with paper. Okay. 
it feels kind of like I have a sense of accomplishment when I have a piece of paper that you know has lines on it, as opposed to, oh look, here's my file. It doesn't seem the same. So uh, I don't. I I still prefer paper, but I do love the the ability to edit and. Uh, I mean, you can fix a lot of mistakes, so I don't have to white out things. Like if I if I'm drawing something and I go, the head's too big, or I might want to, you know, change the tilt of the head or something. That's all stuff I'll do uh, when I scan it in and and adjust things in Photoshop. Sometimes I do. I mean, I always take a couple of hours of adjusting each page. Um, so it's a good tool. It's just not a drawing tool for me. It also, it. I think, I like the. I like the roughness of paper, and um, I think sometimes digital feels too clean. You know, I mean, it, it's still a. It depends on who's doing it, but yeah. When you, you, I've used, I've tried the programs. You know, you can do some nice clean lines, but it. I think in my case, it would make me a little too. Um, uh, I would, it would, I would focus too much on the look of it. And I think it would be too slick and it would kind of lose some of the, whatever life it might have if you kind of draw it with paper and it's a little messy, you know? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I, I love hearing that because, you know, we've talked to so many artists, you know, over the past year and I love to get their take on that because it's so much a part of the, the world, you know, the technology yeah. as it advances. And, you know, there are people that just swear by it. And yeah. you have others that are just don't want to have anything to do with it. Well, um, I mean, the, the advantage is you obviously you can take a, a correct your mistakes. If you slap some lines down, you can just, you know, back back backtrack and take those out or whatever. I mean, there's a there's benefits. The other benefit is you can work in layers. So if you had photo reference, for example, you could literally trace over your photo reference yeah. in an ink layer. Um, so, I mean, a lot of it, you know, drawing buildings and landscapes and things like cars or whatever, you know, you can basically ink over a wireframe SketchUp model, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, it offers you an ability to do a lot greater perfect or accurate detail, mm -hmm. you know, but um, I still, you know, I still prefer to make my mistakes on paper. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. Uh, I wanted to jump back. You mentioned All Star uh, Squadron, and uh, I have to say, I love that series. I love that team, if you will, too. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a really cool premise in that it was kind of you know, you know, it included real events uh, and you know, built the mythology around that. Um, and where kind of, where was the uh, inspiration to create that? Well, I think Roy really had, I mean, he's a, <clears throat> he was a big history buff. And I think he went to great lengths in reading and in, in preparation for, for even that first, you know, the first preview issue, uh, trying to figure out storylines that, he could fit into a timeline because I think as published stories he even I mean he tried to make you know stories that appeared in all-star you know all-star comics and um, the solo stories that different characters he tried to maintain a continuity right. that didn't exist in comics at that time so he based it on when he read it as a kid and when the publication date was and he would then almost work backwards which was kind of clever in a way um, uh, and in some cases, he knew he had to, he would have to fudge some stuff as far as whether an issue of, or an appearance of Hawkman happened before or after, you know, something that was uh, historically dated. So, uh, but I, I found it in that part interesting. Uh, the, to me, the, the premise of the book is unusual. And a lot of people complained even at the time. I know uh, uh, Len Wein was our editor and Len would every so often mention that he thought he was buying a Justice Society book, but instead he's getting, you know, the B, yeah. B team or whatever. And I totally understood that at the time because obviously the Justice Society had a little bit more, maybe a little more sales potential because they'd been seen in, in uh, current DCs, you know, in the last previous 
15 years or so it, with the crossovers with the Justice League or right. their own book that uh, Wally Wood had drawn or had worked on in the, I guess, the late 70s. So, I mean, they had more audience recognition than Liberty Bell or Robot Man or Johnny Quick. Um, but I think ultimately Roy made those characters, he, he elevated them from kind of forgotten or B-level characters to characters that you could, you know, uh, he, he gave them life, you know. So I think with, with ever the art part of it is it was to try to make them somehow distinctive and stand out as well. And I think, you know, we all kind of succeeded because ultimately those characters are still talked about, you know, I mean, even though it's very in much so. nostalgic ways, the people who read the book back then really liked the book and they kept liking it. They didn't, uh, you know, they, they would, if they got into comics, they'd use those characters or they, you know, keep them alive somehow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, they're great characters. It's just unfortunate that every time there's a crisis, they kill them off first. <laughs> I mean, well, I, I was like, what? what? What did Uncle Sam ever do to you guys? Come on. I, I used to I used to think it was funny. And um, there was a point where in the after Roy was gone from from D.C., went back to Marvel. Um, I had only worked. I worked on the books till I think 80. I worked on through Infinity Inc. like issue 10, maybe 84, something like that. And then I did. I went to Marvel. Um, and in the time after I left, well, Crisis, you know, I came back and I inked George on Crisis. The Crisis stuff took away Earth 2 totally and left him with a dilemma of trying to come up with characters that weren't, you know, linked to Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman. Um, and uh, I think there are people who like young all-stars. I tried reading it. I, I mean, I, I, it was just not my thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it was a bad book. It's just that they took the heart out of his concept in a way. So in the in the 80s, when I was starting on Superman, later 80s, um, there was definitely a bias against the, just, the JSA. I mean, they purposely, I think, made not make him, but they 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 gave Roy the opportunity to kind of put the JSA in that kind of loop, uh, Ragnarok loop or whatever. Um, fighting an endless war or whatever and took them out of continuity totally um and there really wasn't much interest in in reviving them except as you say it's like in zero hour uh i was just inking that or finished and finishes over jurgens but i'd get the pages it's like wait what's he doing with the flash <laughs> it was just it felt brutal you know to yeah. to uh and nobody i don't think anybody that DC gave those properties to. I mean, the best of it was really when um, uh, James Robinson and David Goyer and then Jeff Johns, you know, re kind of revamped and, and, you know, brought the JSA book back because they, I think they did justice, no pun intended, they did justice to the, the concept and, you know, kind of brought it even further than Infinity Inc. would have um, uh, by leaning on the old characters and kind of making them the mentors and things like that yeah i always appreciate what with i will sing jeff john's praises in comics till the cows come home because the man does his homework yeah uh, you can well, tell yeah, i mean like he just you know even the most minute thing that had been mentioned let's say 30 years ago yeah. you know in a, in a small panel he will bring it out and basically justify it for whatever reason yeah. and you're like wow that was amazing you know well that's that's the uh i mean that's the roy thomas syndrome you know i mean roy was was uh and again most i think most of the marvel writers really it was the you're you're a uh i guess uh an archaeologist mining for nuggets of continuity yeah. you know um and that that always was an, an intriguing idea because that's what comics became, especially having like a, a, a uniform kind of continuity. Um, but uh, yeah, no, Jeff was good with that. I think, I do think Goyer and, um, and Robinson probably, because Jeff didn't have any name at the time when that book launched, he was, he had just started doing Stargirl and um, was kind of halfway in the movie business. But uh, Goyer and, and James Robinson had, I think the pull 
to kind of launch that you know JSA title in a in a way that maybe DC wouldn't have done for somebody else. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think they gave it a bigger promotion. They made they definitely put put uh, more marketing behind making it a success, and it 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 really was like the early two th two thousand success. I mean that that book was solid through the first run and then the second run that Jeff did on his own um, up through what, 2012, or whatever, up through the to new 52. I mean, the, yeah. the book ran and it was still, a, a, well, a good selling book. Yeah. And they did. Um, and this is where I always get a little fuzzy with there was, you know, they're uh, all star squadron, but there was also freedom fighters and like some of the, the characters or the lineup were, changed or they swap they are inter intermingled somehow because yeah. you had human bomb he was part of all-star and then but he was one of the freedom fighters which yeah. i know you you worked on uh, a newer uh series of that as well yeah which i love that character oh i thought i mean that was part of jimmy uh palmiotti and justin gray had done their they were doing like the freedom fighters as single uh individual characters the idea was that they were going to after the all the individual books were were launched they would team them up and then dc pulled the plug i guess yeah it's a um, bummer but they did yeah. do a re uh, a re well a limited series of freedom fighter not too long ago which was yeah. that was heavy <laughs> well i heard they were pretty good i, I actually they were they were very good a couple of people had told me that it was worth picking up a trade or something because it was um they said it was a good concept and i guess again the there's no bad concept. Like when I did the, when they asked me about the human bomb, I did it because I like, you know, I've known Jimmy uh, for a long time and I knew he, he was enthusiastic about it, but I didn't have any illusions about whether it would sell because of all those characters. I mean, a solo book with the human bomb, human bomb wasn't even a B character. I mean, human bomb was a, a D or, a, you know, E character. There's no sales potential. So it's even like if you did a, <laughs> a tremendous, I mean, I think it, the book worked and I think for a, a mini series or whatever, the story was, was really good, but stores aren't going to order it. You know I mean? It just, it's not an ongoing title. So it doesn't really have the ability to build an audience. You know, when you, when you do a mini series, that's four issues. I believe it was four issues. It could have been yes. five. Was it four? Yeah. If it's four, you really have no ability to build a market or build readership because the comic stores order a certain formula for a first issue, then they cut the order for a second issue and they cut it for a third and they cut it for a fourth. That's the way they order, you know, because they, they have historically seen drop off of, you know, however they, they have a formula for it. So if the first issue sold really well, they just say, well, it's, it's the first issue. Mm -hmm. So issue four is not going to get a bump, you know, right. and issue four is the end of that end of the series so there's really uh there's no hope for a thing like that um like i said you know a lot of those uh concepts are like that you know you you can love them as a reader but you kind of know going in that unless they're marked as a mini series that they might not even get to finish their story you know if it's a a writer's given like a, a, a monthly and it's not a a well-known concept it's really hard to build an audience with something like that. Uh, there's just, you know, there's too many other books competing. Plus, again, you can do a good book and get word of mouth, but a lot of times the word of mouth comes too late for, you know, a project. It, 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 may, it might help sell a trade paperback of it, but it's not going to help keep something alive. Um, so I wanted to jump back to something with, uh, great sales potential, although you probably weren't thinking about it back then, which is, you know, one of the first major crossovers, uh, which was DC's um, Crisis on Infinite Earths. And um, you were the anchor on that. You were working with uh, Perez, George Perez. Um, and you just had mentioned that uh, you had moved on from DC to Marvel and then sort of were lured back. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about sort of the memories of that project, how um, if you had sort of thrown your hat in the ring when you heard about it, if you were sort of kind of poached to come back for this major project and what you thought <laughs> about it when you heard, you know, they were doing this yeah. huge thing. Well, 
when I was doing Infinity Inc., I think it was in like the last couple issues of Infinity Inc., I remember doing uh, the uh, obligatory one or two panel teaser for Crisis. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we didn't know anything what, what it was going to be. I don't even know if George and Marv 100% knew what was going because they were, it was a year in advance. So it was like, here's a guy and this is the mo monitor and here's somebody else. And if you look back on any of those, it's just funny. You could tell that the people who did those teaser panels were not given much info, you know? But uh, so I, I knew it was coming. I knew that they were doing it. Um, I never said, oh, I must be part of this. I went to work at uh, Marvel and uh, originally went to Marvel to, to draw the Squadron Supreme mm -hmm. with uh, Mark Grimwald. I was gonna originally gonna ink it. Burn was gonna do layouts. I was gonna do finishes, and then Burn bailed on it. And Burn poached me for Fantastic Four without Mark knowing, because Mark was gonna then his B his B plan was that uh, Burn, if Burn left, then I would draw. He would have me draw Squadron Supreme, but it never even got to that point of of being offered to me because uh, Burn had like. Uh, just, it's just funny, John had sent me a page. You know, he said that I got asked, are you doing Fantastic Four? You know, this other thing's not happening. So I did, I thought it was totally canceled. And uh, I said, sure, because big fan of Fantastic Four. And then John sent me uh, a page, splash page with Dr. Doom, which didn't appear until I think the fourth issue in my run of inks. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a splash page with Dr. Doom and I inked it and sent it back. And I guess that was kind of like an audition, even though they'd already said I had the job. It was just kind of funny. So it, it went over well. But uh, then I bumped into Mark at a convention and he was like, yeah, Burn, Burn poached you. I was going to have you pencil that when John dropped out. Um, so it was. Burn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, so I, there I was. I was I told um, it was my first experience working with Mike Carlin. Uh, just a terrific experience all around. Um, but I knew that I was uh, I wasn't going to be full time on that because I said I'm I'm just I'm happy to work on burn stuff just to recharge my batteries. I didn't want to go back to full time inking. Um, I was you know definitely was looking for my next pencil assignment, and uh, I'd left DC over a rate issue uh, because I wanted to raise at a certain point, and they they said here's where you here's where you belong. And then I went to Marvel and Marvel was like, no, we'll give you this, you know? So uh, after Marvel gave me this money, you know, like a, a, a good bump and I was working at, at Marvel, then DC started sending me covers and DC said, okay, we're giving you a raise, you know? It was like, well, that was always DC. There was always kind of like a, they would always react after the, whatever happened um, in true family fashion, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> dad makes a mistake or mom makes a mistake and and then they make it up to you by sending you a present or something here's a new bike <laughs> yeah so anyway so i i was really busy while i was working on burn stuff i did probably i must have done 20 maybe 20 or more covers for dc in that year and uh i agreed to do six issues of fantastic four and then the way the storyline worked out they asked me if I'd do eight because John had wanted to finish off a psycho man story. So I said, sure. And in planning for what was going to happen after DC or Pat Bastine, who was the editorial coordinator, asked me if I would draw, if I wanted to draw super um, Superman annual. And it was uh, going to be for Julie Schwartz and Julie, you know, he asked me if I would draw it, said, sure. And this was all planned at the end of that six month period. But then it became like, well, I'm doing eight issues of this. So I have to try to figure out time to draw a 48 page annual as well. And Julie was one of those guys who wanted everything ahead of time. Adding to that, Pat Bastine calls and she says, we really need somebody Dick can't do crisis on a monthly basis and still have his full time you know, job at DC. Um, it's just too much work. And George wants you. And um, I said, the soonest I could do it, like six, issue six. And uh, she, everybody said, fine. So I had my schedule all planned out. And then I got a 
panicky call from Patty at DC. And she says, George is going to quit if you can't start with issue five, because he didn't like Mike DiCarlo's angst at all. And I mean, Mike, Mike did a good job. And again, it's a tough book to do anyways. Uh, Mike did a good job, but it wasn't what he, George was looking for. So I got the full court press. You got to start with issue five. So the month that that coincided, I had tried to get out of the action, the DC comics. It was a DC presents annual. Maybe it was Superman and Superwoman, I guess is the story. And, uh, so I tried to get out of that, but Julie Schwartz would not let me out of it. I mean, there's, you know, I, I could have dropped dead and he probably still would have made me do it. There was no way out. And I'm like, DC, you're, you're scheduling this. You, you want me to do crisis. You have to find some. So the compromise was that, that Ed Barreto would pencil DC presents annual and I would ink it. And then I'm still looking at like, all that did was make it a little bit less bad, but it still meant that issue eight of Fantastic Four, issue five of Crisis and DC Presents Annual always do in the same time frame, like within a month or six weeks. So uh, I had this big crunch to do and uh, I had a studio at the time and Al Vey was trying to get work and trying to work his way into comics at the time. And he would do some like erasing of pages and filling in black areas that had been X'd and stuff. So I said to Al, I said, look, I can do this if you are willing to commit for as long as it takes, six weeks, maybe. We're going to work seven days a week. I said, I'll buy you dinner. You'll earn some money, pay back your rent that he already owed me. And um, he did erase pages and in some cases did straight line backgrounds like city escapes or whatever. And uh, I would ink the main figures and backgrounds that I needed to, but I did most of Crisis because there was no way to kind of, you know, farm that out because it was just more complicated. So, uh, and I would go over his, you know, like with the burn stuff, I went over his, his whatever backgrounds he did. I tried to do all the organic stuff myself, but we wound up getting this thing done somehow. We did like five, six pages a day of inks and somehow got through it, you know? And again, it was one of those experiences where you just, okay, I survived this, how bad can the next job be or whatever? So that's what kind of carries you through. Um, so no, yeah, yeah they, they dragged me into crisis. I, I, you know, it was like combat, you know? I, I have never been in combat, so I don't mean to underplay what that's like, but in comic books, that was like in the trenches, you know, it really was, uh, you couldn't miss shipping because each issue of crisis came out and there were like 12 issues of, you know, a given, or maybe whatever the DC line, there were stories that depended on it coming out at a certain time because whatever weeks books right before and right after that issue of crisis depended on the storyline of crisis. So there was no wiggle room with the deadline. And um, I mean, George is the guy who really deserves the lion's shirt because it, I mean, he did pages day in and day out. You know, I just basically kept up with them. Uh, I would get a couple pages, whether it was one or two pages via FedEx in the morning when I got to my studio, the job was to finish those two pages by the end of the day, put them in a FedEx box and send them back to DC so they could be colored. Or even in some cases we were doing them before they were lettered in the later issues. Um, so it was very tight. And uh, as I was as I was working towards issue 12, there were also double size issues in here, which is kind of crazy to think about. But uh, the last one was was certainly a double size and the, the death of Supergirl was a double size issue. So Dick Giordano ain't half of that. Um, but it was really a nutty experience that you, you know, you survive it and you go again, it was another notch. Okay, I survived crisis. Um, but uh, George asked me, as we were working on issue 11, he wanted me to, he said, we're doing the history of DC universe after this. And I'm like, George, I'm out. I've been looking, to, I'm like counting the days, you know, like I'm in, in my prison cell marking off the, you know, once I finish issue 12, I, I need a break. And uh, so I, I, I didn't do the history of the DC universe, but uh, Carl Kiesel did a nice job on it instead. But- uh, it, it, And Perez's work is super detailed too. Well, and I, mean, I told you, I mean, it's just astounding, you know, yeah, well, he was cranking a, we, that out. 
we had like a, a an agreement right off the bat. I said to him that I would do finishes. The idea was doing finishes all all along. I was going to be fin doing finishes. I said, "Here's what I need from you. I don't need you to put all the lighting in it. If you don't, you know, I mean, but I need the costumes to be accurate so I know who everybody is because I'm not going to be. I didn't have time. I didn't have the comic book DC comic book library to know who all the characters were. I never got a plot because a lot of those, um, a lot of those issues. I think after the first. I want to say first two or three, maybe even four, George and Marv just talked it over on the phone. And if George had any issues, he called the editor, he called Bob Greenberg or he called Len Wein. Um, but it, there, I don't believe there was any, I never saw a plot. So I had nothing to follow except the possibility of George writing margin notes of, of what was going on. And it's a testament to his storytelling that you could follow as much as the story visually, because sometimes they like I was saying, the word balloons. If the if the they had time, the pages went to the letterer and then they went to me. But rather than keep me waiting for the letterer for like the transit time of maybe two extra days, I would get pages directly from him, and then the lettering would be done as a paste up separately. And I didn't get script with those pages. I just got you know pencil pages to ink. So it was. Uh, I had no idea where it was going. I mean, I had no, you know, access to any of that. I just, you know, I grabbed on and I, I wrote <laughs> and hoped it wouldn't uh, knock me off. That was the the thing. But it was, it was, you know, it's a gratifying project and nobody but George could have done it. I mean, and I don't mean to undermine or underplay what Marv did because it was certainly, you know, a huge contribution on his part as well. But George did the heavy lifting and, um, Nobody, there's nobody even, uh, and I've talked to Phil Jimenez about this too, because Phil did the Infinite Crisis and no one was a bigger George fan than Phil. And uh, I said, you know, as much as you did on Infinite Crisis, you could never have done Crisis. There's just nobody could have fit 12, in 12 issues, George did 24 issues. You know, I mean, content wise, nobody is able to, really, I don't think anybody in comics has ever been able to do as much content as he does and as much storytelling in those 12 you know 12 issues it just it's like you say you can look at it now it's still kind of phenomenal oh, uh, he introduced absolutely. multiple earth's characters and you know the figures could be like uh, an inch tall but they all had you know perfect costume detail and mm -hmm. uh, you could tell who they were you know it's nuts. And that was another thing I know that he, I believe, I, I think I'm remembering it right, but I remember him something about making sure that all the characters were colored correctly and that the colorist didn't do too many knockout colors because you wanted the readers to identify who was in this scene. You know, it's the freedom fighters. It's not some generic characters that are silhouetted with blue or something like that. Um, and I think that was a major selling point from the fan point of view, too, that, you know, it, 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 the fans loved a lot of characters that they never thought they would love or that they thought were lame, you know? No, I understand. I wanted to talk quickly, because <laughs> everyone now loves Shazam, but you were the guy who kind of made him cool again. You, you dusted him off and you brought him back to the forefront. Uh, did you approach DC and say, hey, I'd like to take a crack at Shazam, or did they come to you and say... You know what, what do you do with this? I was always asked to do these things. Um, <laughs> I I did Sh I did Shazam stuff. I did Shazam when I was uh, I guess I wanted to do Shazam in All Star Squadron, but we never got um, any. Uh, I, the DC used to have to pay a fee to Fawcett, still own the characters. DC licensed the characters from Fawcett, so Roy would want to have them in the background of a story, and DC wouldn't uh, give him. Captain Marvel because they'd have to pay $100 extra to use them. And they, they said, if you're going to use them for a whole story, it's one thing. But if he's just going to be one of 100 characters in the background, we're not going to pay for that. So I always liked drawing the character. I thought he was intriguing. I love the, uh, the you know, when DC did reprints in the 70s of the, and they relaunched the book. Um, I was a fan of that, mostly of the re reprint part of it. Um, and then I watched... Roy tried to mount a bunch of different, uh, 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 you know, mini series and try to launch it as a series. And I don't, 
I didn't read all of them. I know that they did it in Action Comics after he and Tom Mandrake had done their uh, miniseries, The New Beginning or something like that. Um, but DC, internally, DC didn't care about, they didn't seem to like those. That was what I, got, I was hearing. Yeah. So uh, at some point, John Byrne was going to do it. And my friend, Jonathan Peterson, who I'd worked with on uh, the Batman movie comic, and he had, he had been an assistant editor on Superman. And we, we hang out on weekends and go to movies and stuff. Jonathan was given the, the property to uh, relaunch and Byrne was going to do it. And John had started his relaunch. He'd drawn a couple of pages. He'd written, you know, his plots and stuff. And then uh, War of the Gods happened. And War of the Gods was built around the Captain Marvel premise and property as it existed, whereas John was supposed to reinvent it from the ground up. And they were going to come out at the same time. So he had a big problem with that. And uh, DC did, wasn't willing to kill War of the Gods or take I mean, Captain Marvel, the Shazam family was very important to War of the Gods. It's, it's, so it was hard for them to extract them from there. But it was just the type of thing DC did a lot of where they just would have projects going off in here that no one would find out about until there it was like you were doing one here and there's one here. They're coming out within a month of each other and they're not going to they're going to conflict. That happened a lot during that time at DC. Um, so John bailed. He left the project and then Jonathan approached me and he said, hey, you know, why don't we do it? We, we work together on the Batman movie thing. And he and I got talking about it and we decided to do it like a, the graphic novel standalone. I said, I want to do a hardcover because I've never had a hardcover. I want to do full color because I've always enjoyed working in color and paint and stuff. So I got those concessions from DC and then we just we approached it as if it were the adaptation of a Shazam movie and that was the whole idea of, of even the pacing of it was it wasn't it wasn't produced as a 20 page chunk like it would be four issues of something it was produced as a standalone one shot which again the our little secret premise was that we were adapting the Shazam movie that didn't exist <laughs> um, but yeah it, it's funny when when the series came along a couple of years later for a year later, maybe a little more than a year. When we did the series, Jonathan was gone. Um, Mike Carlin took over and uh, we were just swimming against the uh, tide, unfortunately, because it was the grim and gritty era. And um, I didn't want to do that. Uh, I didn't want, I mean, I tried to walk a line between being too retro and being current. So what I did was I chose a medium and I said, okay, my uh, feeling for the Shazam book, the regular monthly was that it was pretty much gonna evoke the Marvel comics that I read when I was 10, 11 years old. So I was thinking Spider-Man, you know, like around issue 4950. That was my, uh, that was kind of my like uh, little secret touchstone for that and uh, and we had a we had a loyal audience and we sold pretty well right up until dc announced the cancellation about eight issues before the last before the end oh. and then of course the last eight issues the orders just tanked I, I still don't understand why they did that it was in the wizard age where i think they were trading news bits for coverage you know but uh but it's so it was a, it was always you know it was a, a mid-seller it sold as well as plenty of books that continued on uh, up through 70 or 80 issues, you know, but uh, it just, it kind of fell victim to, uh, I guess my blindness about, I figured as long as I was wanting to do it, DC would be happy to, you right. know, to keep it going. And my goal was to get to issue 50 because first, the first Spider-Man I picked up off the newsstands that kind of ignited that comic book love was Spider-Man number 50. So everybody up there knew Jerry's trying to get to issue 50 and DC wanted to cancel it with issue 43. And then they ultimately gave me up through like issue 40, I guess, 47 or 48. And it was just frustrating. You know, it's like, come on, two more issues. <laughs> and I really wish that they had just reassigned. It was a case where they wanted it to, I wish they had reassigned it. In other words, if they were looking to get me on something else that they would have just picked a new, a new team and done a, 
in, you know, like uh, in continuity, just a new team to continue it because we actually did, I think, make inroads by having it published for, you know, four years. Um, that's what a lot of it is what, what keeps a character, you know, I think relevant is just being continually published and not having long breaks. You know, if they had basically committed to it, I think the character would have had maybe a better standing as well, but they always would do that. I mean, Wonder Woman, it was probably contractual, but they kept Wonder Woman going over along the entire history. There were plenty of decades that it sold poorly, um, but you know, in a way they, they're building their own legacy. You know, DC bought Captain Marvel and Shazam from Fawcett. DC never had the, uh, Million, million copy sales that uh, Fawcett did for DC. It was always, oh, this is the character Superman put out of business. So they didn't have that love, you know, uh, or, or any vested interest in, in bringing it back to any heights because it never had those heights for them, you know? So he's kind of like the stepchild, I guess. Thanks. Um, uh, I wanted to jump in. Uh, I want also going to be mindful of your time, but at the same time, uh, I have to ask if you, you about, got time. I got time. <laughs> I got, um, uh, I have to ask you about Superman. Now, um, when I first got into comics, um, death of Superman was the event, which I think everyone has heard me say at nauseam at this point. However, um, I'll say it again. So when I first got into comics, that was the story arc that got me into it. And at this, at that as, as a part of that, you know, reading Death of Superman and all the subsequent series and reading the previous, you know, issues and whatnot, names, I, I started to actually learn, uh, you know, the names of the writers and artists, and yours was one of them. And over the years, it just became synonymous in my head, and I'm sure amongst others, you know, Superman, and there was Dan Jurgens, Jerry Ordway, Tom Grummet, Brett Breeding. Um, I think in doing my research that you've done uh, out of all of your work that you've done the most Superman. Is that correct? Probably. Yeah. Um, how is that for you working on such an iconic character and doing so much of that character that must have, you must just feel a lot of ownership to that after a certain period of time. Well, I feel ownership to that era because um I came on, again, after one of the enticements of crisis. After, I mean, I will say that DC told me, Dick Giordano, you know, uh, we occasionally, he'd invite me out to dinner. And uh, the, there were business dinners, but they were fun. And at one point, while crisis was going on, I believe, it was kind of maybe we're around issue seven or eight. He said the plan was to relaunch Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, the entire main line of DC was going to relaunch at, at, at the end of crisis. And uh, he said, what would you rather do, Superman or Batman? And I was like, going to say Batman. And he goes, before I could say that, he goes, I think I see you as more of a Superman guy. And I was like, I'm not going to argue, <laughs> you know. So I knew I was going to be involved in a relaunch of Superman, but I didn't know, you know, it, it, it kind of dragged. And uh, by, I think, issue t eight or nine of Crisis, we knew it wasn't going to happen right after Crisis. And so I started talking to Paul Levitz. We did a bunch of, we did San Diego, Chicago, San Diego that summer towards the end of Crisis. And we started plotting out a sequel to Crisis that would be a year later, or that would come out a year later, called Crisis of the Soul. And it was, uh, it ultimately kind of, became legends after uh, I was off of it. But uh, he and I had co-plotted this thing. So I knew Superman was gonna happen within that. So, cause this was gonna be a 12 issues, you know, series. Um, so as I was waiting for that to happen, I wound up again, well, doing other stuff. And then Byrne left Fantastic Four and they asked me to draw some Fantastic Four and I knew I would do it. I was just doing it in between that and starting up Superman. So I did a few issues of FF. And uh, then I thought, well, maybe I'm not doing, maybe they're going to ask me to ink burn on Fantastic Four. I just really didn't know what was going on. 
<clears throat> and then I started getting pages of man of his Man of Steel miniseries in pencil form and was reading them and thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. I have no idea. DC didn't know how I was going to fit into it. And then I, they said, OK, here's what's going to happen. Burns going to do action comics and Superman. And you're going to do a new book. It's going to be the original Superman numbering, but it's going to be Adventures of Superman. And uh, it's going to be written by Alan Moore. And I was like, oh, wow, I hit the jackpot, you know. And, um, and then in the space of like maybe a month, two months, it was suddenly I was working with Marv. And I was, I mean, again, you can't imagine the disappointment only because I held Alan Moore was at this high bar. And uh, so it was a little disappointing, even though I made, you know, we made the best of it. I never met, brought that up to Marv or anything, but, but it was very disappointing from a personal point of view because I was huge Alan Moore fan from the time of the, the uh, we started getting the Miracle Man or, you know, Marvel Man, uh, British uh, comics and stuff. I just thought his stuff was phenomenal. So uh, anyways, I was on there from the, the right after Man of Steel. I was like, I survived the first year with Marv, then worked with Byrne and co-plotted um, for a year with him. And then when he left, I was the last man standing. So uh, John was the big target. And I think when I was able to stay on and Carlin let me write, uh, John had already taken all the hits from the fans. So I think fans were like kind of predisposed to, to give me and Roger Stern, who was working on Superman, the benefit of the doubt. Um, but we really, we started working that continuity thing, even when John was, um, when John and I were co-plotting especially, but we tried to, to, to do a, a little bit of cross-pollination between the books so that adventures sold better because Superman, the main title, a lot of, a lot of people bought that because it was on the newsstands, but Adventures of Superman didn't make it to a lot of a lot of markets, and the comic market didn't buy a lot of copies of, of the Superman books. So we figured tying those books together was a way to make the, a reader of Superman want to buy the other books or seek them out because hey, there's stuff I'm missing, you know. Um, and that was, I think, money. there was like four. Was it, at that point, were there four or were there only three at that point? No, there was we, like we, when John Man left, action. when John left, we had uh, Action Comics had just like within it, maybe a couple of months before John left the book, Action Comics became Action okay. Comics Weekly. OK, so John did Superman twice monthly and Adventures came out in between there. OK, so uh, my first issue of Adventures that I was suddenly the writer of happened in a bad way because the deadline was that I was bracketed between two Supermans and suddenly Byrne left. And my first issue would have been due in like two weeks or <laughs> something crazy. Got it. So, so I had just been, I had been working on the annual. It was going to be my writing debut, but I wasn't drawing it. Um, John Statham, I was drawing it. And um, so choice of, trying to get something done in two weeks or missing a deadline, I suggested, could you run the annual without, do the issue without ads? And they did, they ran, um, I guess it was, I don't even remember the issue number now, 443 maybe or something, 440, I think it was 443. They ran it, that what was this annual story was like 30 some pages, they ran no ads in that book so that they could have something in between the next, you know, um, but yeah, so I, I really liked the character. I mean, I was a big fan of the movies. I, I was a big fan of the very first movie, I should say. And I always liked Christopher Reeve in all the movies. Um, I thought he was just a, a great embodiment of, of Superman. Even four. But, what's that? Even number four. I, there's, you know, there's, there's good moments in all the movies. <laughs> Four has great moments, great scenes with, I mean, him destroying the nuclear weapons in the beginning was great. And then his, when he's dying, his uh, uh, conversations with Lois Lane are really good. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in, in Superman three, the fight with his alter, his, his alter ego, his bad self was great. Yeah. All the Smallville stuff was really great and just heartfelt, but the movies kind of sucked, you know? I mean, that's <laughs> the first to me is that, he was great in all of them. I mean, you know, most of the, the like Lois, they all brought what they needed to bring to it, but he was, 
he was just the embodiment and the movies really uh, kind of didn't hold up their end of it in a lot of ways. But um, I agree with but you. Yeah. So that was, I mean, his, the whole thing in the first movie and the, the warmth and kind of Norman Rockwell-esque uh, feel for Smallville and all that, that just totally appealed to me. And uh, that was, you know, where my love of, of that Superman came from was the distinct difference from previous versions where I think the accepted wisdom was that Clark Kent was the disguise and Superman was the real guy. In our, you know, relaunch, Clark Kent was the real guy and Superman was the disguise, you know, because Clark Kent had to live his, his adolescence as an earthling, not knowing he was special until he started manifesting powers. And that, that was like the big distinction. And that was what made the character uh, approachable to me. And, and, and I think to a lot of the audience that, uh, you know, he wasn't the guy who's going to push planets around or tie a chain around the moon and, and drag it around or something like that. I mean, we, we liked the fact that he had some limits, even though he was Superman, it just, it felt like, uh, I wanted him to be grounded. And I know Byrne wanted it. I think John was always torn between being a fan of the fifties stuff, which was a little goofy and uh, in a way that kind of compromised, I think, what maybe fans expected him to do on Superman. So he maybe loved it. He loved that a specific version too much. So his, his stuff was trying to be more grounded and realistic. But at the same time, it, it, it owed a little maybe too much to the, the goofiness of the, of the 50s. But, um, but it's still enjoyable stuff. And I, I, like I said, I, I always felt like kind of in the perfect spot to benefit from working with him on it and also from having him kind of take most of the heat for the uh you know i mean it was stuff that he did you know i mean he uh him having the superman execute the kryptonians in the pocket universe that basically gave us two years worth of stories you know and and all that stuff kind of ultimately leads to the death of superman that little storyline <laughs> well that was like i mean the weird thing is that there's a lot of stuff that i think uh that we did before death of superman that just doesn't get reprinted and the death of superman is reprinted you know it's probably on its fifth omnibus by now um but we did good stuff we did uh, panic in the sky was a fun story we did yeah that was uh, great the, the blaze satanist war we did a bunch of little mini crossovers, but we did a lot of good, I think, characterization in those uh, stories from about 88, you know, through the death of Superman that a lot of that doesn't get reprinted. Dark Knight over Metropolis. I mean, it was, it was all fun and heartfelt and all those stories were us trying to, you know, find a way to get the attention of the comic stores because we, we you know, we had critical, uh, critical, praise but we weren't selling like we thought we should be selling and we just weren't selling in comic stores we were selling on the newsstand in the, in a market that was kind of you know shrinking um so it's funny that the death of superman ultimately winds up being okay we take away this guy that you've taken for granted and we make you i mean ultimately it, it plays out in fiction and in reality almost the exact same way people realize they missed him even though they hadn't spent much time with them, you know, um, which was the, the allegory that we we're going for was, you know, you, this guy's there to save you, you saved in the world, but you've taken him for granted, you know? Um, yeah. You've, you echo what Dan Jurgen said. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> we goes, that, you guys didn't care about him before, but now all of a sudden it's, Oh, Superman's dead. Okay. <laughs> well, then that was the, I mean, again, that's how I think the best stories kind of have, some impetus like that, you know, that's what gives them a little bit of extra oomph, you know. Um, not everything's based on your life or whatever, but I think when you have something that you really, you know, like, and I, Dan, I don't know if Dan, well, Dan wasn't part of this, but the, the, I think one of the biggest impetus things for Death of Superman was we did a store appearance, it was Mike Carlin, Jonathan Peterson was, I think, assistant editor on the Superman books at the time. So it was Mike Carlin, Jonathan Peterson, Dennis Janke, and I. 
we gave up one of our Saturdays, uh, which were working days. We gave up a Saturday to go to a, a comic store signing after we had done um, we had done like a promotional thing for Superman. All three books had I did painted co color over other people's work, but they were, all four books had painted color covers, and they all had like. Uh, an extra eight page segment in the back as a reader incentive to try to get new readers. Mine had like a Jimmy Olsen diary, eight page diary. I think Roger, oops, sorry, Roger Stern had, you know, some Cadmus thing. And, and uh, anyways, so we had three books at the time. We're trying to do self-promotion because DC doesn't promote ongoing titles. That's the big thing is they will, they wouldn't spend any money to it an ad or a poster or any extra promotion. So we did all of our promotion through house ads um, just by having a house ad ready for all, the, all these in case a letters page from another editor. If he had to turn a book in on a Friday and he didn't get his letters page in time, it went to the printer and they would put house ads in the slot for the letter page. So Carlin was on to this. And then we always had a letters page. Uh, we always had a house ad for a Superman storyline ready to go. So we got a lot of promotion that way, which was, he was just clever. So we do this comic store appearance and the book came out on, on Wednesday or whatever the ship day was then. We go on a Saturday, we show up at the store. The store did hardly any promotion, but the store ordered no extra copies of the comic. My comic and Dennis and I worked on came out Wednesday. There were no copies available at the store. They had ordered no extras. They'd ordered oh. only enough for the people who had special ordered them. So we showed up and there were no comics for us to sign. And maybe the 10 people who came in, we did like little head sketches or whatever and tried to be make a, you know, make something of it, but it was a disaster. And uh, that was, we just said, we got to get the, the attention of the comic stores. They, they're not going to, you know, unless we do something, we need to hook them somehow. We need to, to get them, you know, interested in the long term. So that started instead of doing something like we had done this promotion with the extra pages. It was like we need to do a crossover story within the book as a way to make it bigger somehow. Like, you know, instead of a DC company crossover, it's the Superman family crossover. And that's that's where it started. That's really the right there was the impetus. It's like this sucks. <laughs> No, you know, no one has mentioned that we have yeah, spoken to the, so many people who have been a part of this. Not one person has mentioned that. That's really interesting. I mean, everyone well, has was, mentioned the Superman summit and everyone said, yeah. well, let's just kill him. Uh, yeah. But no one has mentioned this, this no, aspect no. of it. It's it very was, interesting. I mean, this was a DC sanctioned appearance. So it wasn't like the store. I mean, it was like DC sent them money for promotion. They sent them the tools to promote. They did virtually nothing, but the very least they could have done was to order enough copies of the book so that we could that they could sell them on that Saturday, but that also we could sign them. It was ridiculous. Yeah. So wow. I mean, and it's one thing if you someone your friend says, "Hey, would you come in and sign at my store?" Well, the least the bare minimum that any store owner would do is to have copies of whatever titles you did available to sign. And, uh, wow. you know, they did nothing. It was just, we were so, I think we were all like morally, you know, uh, crushed, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and that was really the, like I said, after that, it was like, we got to do something. And that's when we started doing the, you know, the, the, the crossovers within those three titles. Um, and it worked little by little. We got good, you know, we started getting good notice from that and sales went up a little bit, but it still was mostly uh, on the newsstand, you know. Um, comic stores were the the one that, that it required having a, a book that sold out and, and a, you know, they put it up on the wall for $5 the week after it came out. Um, but that was the opposite of what DC's policy was back then. If a book sold out, DC went back to press, you know. So Marvel, Marvel encouraged the sold out books because they knew that you know, if this comic store could jack up the price and have an excuse for it, then, you know, that, that helped them in a way, but it would hmm. hurt the creator of that hot book because they would not get royalties on any possible extra sales. Hmm. So it was really kind of a, 
interesting dilemma, but DC always went with, we'll go back to press. And that was better for us because then if you had a book that caught someone's fancy, chances are you were gonna finally get a royalty as opposed to you know, going to the comic store and seeing something on the wall. Interesting. Well, um, that is, that's pretty interesting. I haven't heard that, <laughs> that aspect of it. Uh, Jerry, I need to uh, thank you for your time because I think the three of us can kind of talk to you for another hour or so. Um, you've done so much interesting work on your career and I don't think we've tapped into, you know, I think we had half a ton more, half of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We'd love to have you back in the future if, you know, schedule permits you to do sure. so, of course. Sure. Um, where can, you know, where can everyone see your work, follow you, things of that nature? Mostly I'm on Twitter. Okay. Uh, it's just at Jerry Ordway on Twitter. I'm not verified yet. I went, I tried getting verified at one point, but they, you know, it was like a couple of years ago and it was more hassle than it was worth. I don't know if it's changed, but. Um, probably not yeah. probably gotten worse <laughs> <laughs> but I, I post artwork i post uh, convention sketch stuff and i post uh, you know current stuff on there hey so that was our interview with jerry ordway uh i, I really enjoyed talking to him i think we probably going to talk to him for another couple hours i think we say that for most guests but um quite frankly i think we could have uh he was very willing to talk to us about anything uh, one thing that really I find interesting about people such as him is that, you know, the artist and writer, it is, it, it's quite a tax, task to do one on its own, but to put your frame of mind into both writing and, um, you know, drawing or inking, uh, it's pretty crazy. That, that, that's a lot to take on, but, um, you know, anyone that could do that is pretty amazing. Yeah, and uh, I'm I'm always looking. Uh, he lives uh, in Connecticut, not far from me. Uh, sometimes we both shop at Cave Comics in Newtown. So the hope is one day I get to bump into him there. You know, give him the old bro hug. Hey, thanks for being on the show. And then we'll become best friends. Yeah, and and I think um, we had mentioned the Ordway discount. Uh, yeah. Or and so hopefully you can um, you know partake in partake in that uh, you know like uh, everybody mentioned I think we left some questions on the table so always open to have uh, Mr. Ordway back uh, he you know a few things we wanted to dig into that we just didn't get the chance to but we we covered a lot of ground and um, I think uh, it's a uh, one to put in the record book so. Let's turn the page. Um, you know where to find us on social, Facebook, Instagram, Dollar Bin Bandits. On Twitter, DB Bandits. Hey, hit us up on email, dollarbinbandits at gmail.com. Listen, we have a couple great reviews up on Apple. I'm so excited by that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we would love to have more, more uh, ratings, more reviews, uh, more subscriptions. So please hit us up. Uh, we continue to get more and more guests and we love to bring them to you. So until next time, peace. Peace.